Oh, I'm glad to be able to be back with everybody tonight. I'm glad to have everybody here. We have a good group. I hope we uh, that this will be profitable. We're taking up where we left off last time we were together, which is First John chapter two, and tonight we're going to spend some time on verses twelve through fourteen. First John two twelve through fourteen. Now, I'm going to read those, and I hope you'll read along with me. I have a reason for reading them, because of how we shall attempt to interpret them. So we begin in verse 12, 1 John chapter 2, and the Apostle John writes, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, Father, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Now, on the surface, those may seem to be relatively simple, but I suggest uh, if you start to explain them to somebody, you might find they're not quite that simple. And our whole goal in this, as it is in the other Bible study, is to lead out of the text. Only what God put in that text. And not read into it something that is not there. One is exegesis. The other is called isogesis. We're interested in exegeting the passage. That means we have to know the meaning of words. And how they're used. In this case, we'll be referring back to... Um, some Greek material, and so we'll have to bear, bear along with that. Now, leading up to these verses, we see that John has charged uh, his readers to observe an old yet new commandment to love one another. That's what we spent time on last time together in the study of 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 to a left. But now we focus with that in the background where John specifically addresses various members of the Lord's church. Those who, of course, had the letter written to them. And that's what we have that I just read in 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. Now, you may want to take notes and watch closely. And I'll do my best to not be too technical on this. We always say you have to get back to where the people were then as much as possible to understand things as they were sent then and take the truth as it was presented to them in their language and various other aspects of their society. And bring the truth over to us because truth doesn't change. Truth is truth and always will be true, regardless of what anybody thinks about it or says about it or tries to do to it. It just simply is the truth. Now, therefore, we need to understand something about John and a little bit about inspiration. Inspiration, the Greek word theophanoustos, means uh, God is in control. Let's just sum it up that way. The human hand that wrote this and the brain behind it was not in control in the sense that the material was from him, in this case, the Apostle John. But God had the ability and had in writing the Bible to take a man according to that man's own ability and use of language and inspire him to use the words in the original text that's here in the Greek 
to write exactly what God wanted written. And this is what we need to understand about John. We have in this section what, if you study a number of commentaries, especially those that want to delve into the Greek a little bit, it's almost a, a rhythmical uh, type approach. When you read it, if you read it out loud, you'll catch that. And it raises a number of questions, such as the ones I want to note now. Um, I'm not going to be dogmatic on that on this, but I think you'll see if you follow me through uh, uh, through my explanations of these things that you will see at least some of it to be applicable. Now, remember, this is written to Christians, and John, an apostle of Christ, is wanting them to have their joy as Christians full. He wants them to have the same fellowship with God that the apostles have with God. And thus, he wants them to walk in love of God, love of Christ, love of truth, and love of one another. And remember, this love does not lead one away from doing God's will, but it leads one to do God's will. This love seeks the highest good of another. And being that this is part of the New Testament of Christ, then, of course, it expresses the will of Christ to these Christians, and it pertains to Christian living, specifically, and this is an important point, specifically to their own growth and development in spiritual matters. So keep that in mind as we look at these questions. First of all, why did John use the present tense I write in the first three clauses that we read. Then he switches to I have written in the second three. Now, we know God doesn't do anything just by happenstance. John's inspired with the Holy Spirit. He's writing part of the mind of Christ. He's writing to Christians for the reasons we spend a great deal of time on and that his whole book is addressed to explain so there's a reason he did that if you look to the greek grapho it translates into english i write if you were to take a first year greek course after you'd learned the alphabet and um the vowels and so forth then some of the first vocabulary you would ever learn would be this grapho i write Thus, it is rendered in English in the way that it is here, as I read from the King James Version in these passages. But then, in the second three clauses, he uses a Greek word, not I write, but a form of it. And by the way, that uh, Greek word, I write, just the way you read it, just in the present tense, and to render it into English, it puts it in our present tense. And remember the two differences. Present tense in Greek means it's linear action. It's always going on. It's not like present tense where we'd say, where are you now? Well, I'm right here right now. So let's keep that in mind when it comes to an English scholar and a Greek scholar combined. And he's trying to say, or she is, in English, what the Holy Spirit had John write in Greek. So it's a matter of having to look at that to get the full meaning of the pen. And if you read commentaries, you'll get some of that material, which you can cut a lot of corners if you can go to something like Vines Expository Dictionary New Testament Words and then start there. And if you can go further than that, that's fine. So he used the present tense, I write grapho with the first three clauses. And then he uses, I have written, and that Greek word is egrapsa, egrapsa, which is a form of grapho. It's called, a big word I doubt many of us have ever heard, if you look it up in the Greek, it's called epistolary aris. Now, an aris over against a present tense is punctiliar action. Punctiliar means point action. Boom, that right there. Doesn't continue on, it just right there. 
Well, if you know the Greek grammar, you realize those are two very important points you have to learn about verbs when it comes to Greek grammar. Now, a person translating into English is limited because he cannot put it in English exactly as it was said in Greek. He has to use the language he's rendering it into, the target language. So we wonder why. Why did the Holy Spirit have John say, I write in the first three clauses, clauses which is present tense, and then I have written egrapsa, epistolary errors, in the second three. Then another question. To what writing does he refer in the first instance? And to what writing does he refer in the second instance? Then we raise the question, because we see children showing up so much in John's writing as he addresses the people, the brethren. So we ask the question, what's the meaning of the word children in the first clause of each of these divisions I've just mentioned? And you notice that as we read through 1 John 2, 12 through 14. Well, we see that um, the word, we'll have reason to refer to this again, uh, technion. In the first reference to children, one word, you don't have to know the meaning of it, just to hear the difference. But then he uses padion in the second. In other words, they're both rendered the same in English. So why do you use, why did God have him by the Holy Spirit, use this word technion in the first reference and pideon in the second. Now, this raises the question. Last one I'm going to raise, at least right here at this time. In what sense? Now, that needs to be emphasized. In what sense is the reference to fathers, children, and young men to be taken. What do I mean by that in what sense? Literal or figurative? If we're going to lead out of this passage what God intended us to get out of it, we've got to consider these questions and consider the very words the Holy Spirit used because we don't see it as readily in the English once it's translated. Now, I think it's taught clearly throughout the New Testament, what I'm what we're going to look at here in a moment. So you don't have to get all you need to know from this one passage. But we're studying this passage, aren't we? We're not somewhere else. So the ideas I'm going to set out that I think is what is taught here are taught elsewhere. And you'll recognize as we go through. And I think I have this pretty well lined out. And I'm not the only one that's done this, but you, you follow me. And I think some of what I presented, if it's strange to your ears, uh, may be made more clear as we um, go through it. Because there have been many and varied answers, various answers here in these questions. But here's what, without going into all of that, what I think is going on. Now, I said earlier, we had to know something about the literature that was the languages, in other words, and how they functioned during the time in which the Bible was being given. If you were to study in the Old Testament and you were to study Hebrew, you would see there are certain things called Hebrew Hebraisms. They are certain things that are said. Uh, that were peculiar to them and their part of the world and their language the way they said them. Ken made a comment in his uh, talk a while ago about East Texas comments. Well, what does that mean? And what would it mean 2,000 years from now if somebody took his manuscript and rendered it in some language that was living then and yet maybe English has been dead for a thousand years. So you have to consider all of that. Well we can readily pick up on those things in our spoken language with the background and culture we're in, how we use those things. 
but sometimes after time has passed and those ethnic and cultural things are all gone, it's harder to reach back and understand them. Language is a product of the people and the things they were doing at that time. Now, that being said, I think we have here, knowing John is a Jew, and they would use certain Hebraism, even when they wrote Greek. They were familiar with it. And what we have here is, I think, where the same thing's being said for sake of emphasis. Now, we do that kind of thing in English language when we're wanting something to be uh, called, on, uh, called on to and understood and don't miss it. And in writing, we might write it in capital letters or we might do that and underscore it. We might circle it. Uh, when you're speaking, you might say something real strong to make a point. But in both instances, the writing in which John refers is the very letter or epistle he is writing at the time he uses these things. Now, unlike 1 John 2, if we've gone over 1 John 2, verse 1, and then later, verses 18 and 28, and you go on through the book, chapter 3, 7, chapter 4, 4, and chapter 5, verse 21, where children, that's what we're working with here, children appears to be a term of endearment for all Christians. I think we have in this passage, in 1 John 2, 12 and 13, the word children seems to refer to a specific class of Christians. It's not, in other words, just a term of endearment. He's talking about growing up spiritually in Christ. Remember, he's already laid the background. God is light. In him is no darkness at all. You are children of light. I want you to have your joy full as children of light. I want you to not sin, but if you do, I want you to know we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. Notice, the righteous. So he's beginning to develop this thing so it hits everybody. Now watch it. In whatever spiritual stage of growth you find yourself. Now think about this. It won't seem so strange. A person is 16 years old and they study the Bible for several months with a capable Bible teacher and they want to obey the gospel and they do. Do they have Christ? Do they have the Father? Have they been reconciled to God? Are they justified in His sight? Are they where all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are? Ephesians 1 3. Of course they are. But what about the person who's been in the church 35 years and throughout that time has studied and applied the truth of Are God? Are you using the burner? I smell gas. And those things would make a tremendous difference in the two. Yet both of them are benefiting from the same thing. Yet one is behind the other in growth and development, in knowledge. So John is addressing his letter to all Christians, whether they've just been baptized into Christ or whether they've been in the church 40 years and faithful all that time, or 10 years, whatever it is. I think we need to keep that in mind because as elders, as preachers, as Bible school teachers, as fathers and mothers, we have to recognize that about the different places people find themselves in their own spiritual growth and, develop and development. So I want to emphasize that point because I think that he's addressing three basic groups of Christians. And they're at different stages. 
of their Christian life. In effect, um, we see that all the time. And I don't know of a person that is wise, the true sense of the word wisdom, and trying to reach people with the gospel that doesn't understand that about people in the church, that there are different places in their knowledge and practice of the truth and in their understanding of a lot of things. We could go more on this, but think of uh, the qualifications of elders as a person is not to be a novice, somebody who's new at things. That person is not to be appointed as an elder. Now think about the implications of that. And then think about newborn creature in Christ or one who is full grown or whatever. And I think I've made my point. So what can we glean from this particular section, verses 12 through 14? And let me emphasize it again, that there are three stages of the Christian life. The first one is the stage of infancy, the stage of infancy. Now, for this all to work like God and John intended, people have to be aware of human development. There's infancy and so on. There's got to be a parallel in people's mind to get the message that's set out here. So the stage of infancy in which Christians are called little children, as it's rendered, into our English language. Now, both terms used by John normally in the Greek language refers to small infant, little baby, we might say. The Greek word is technion. It's the diminutive of techno. And techno, as we've seen here, is an infant, an infant. So he calls some of those he's addressing here as infants in Christ. Now he goes to a different Greek word, hadion, and that's the neuter diminutive of the word heis. This, if you look at the lexicon anyway, the Greek lexicon, it'll talk about that this is a childling. That's not a word we would use much, if ever. A childling of either sex. That is properly an infant. Or in the Greek, they could do this by extension, a half grown boy or girl. And Mark, in writing and using this language, does that in Mark chapter 5, verses 39. Through 42, Mark 5, verses 39 through 42. So, those who are new Christian, or we may say immature Christian, are thus spoken of, as I alluded to a moment ago, as babes in Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 1, Galatians 4 19, and then again in the Hebrews epistle, chapter 5, verses 12 through 13. Now, of course, at this stage of Christian growth and development, this can be a very difficult time. Now, you can see some of that understood in some early uh, other writings in the New Testament because it's difficult because you're still more carnal than spiritual. You remember Paul writing to the Corinthians due to the problems existent in that church and said, you are yet carnal, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 1. And thus, such can be a source of anxiety for those who are trying to teach them, guide them, and lead them along. Paul ran into this and addressed the church of Galatia. In Galatians 4, in verse 19, he displays his great concern for them. He's trying to get them through this babes in Christ stage. And if you think again of an infant human being, they're at a very delicate stage. Nearly everything has to be done for them. They couldn't exist long on their own. So there has to be a lot of nurturing. And thus that may remind you of what Paul said 
that he had nurtured some as a nurse cares for children. I think that recognizes in other places that there are different stages of growth and development as children of God. So what do these people do? They need to focus. Well, direct their focus to what? The sincere milk of the word. Hebrews 5, 12 through 13. And as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Now, if we're, if we're in a congregation, it doesn't have to be very large. You're going to have infants. You're going to have little children. Well, they're members of the church. They've obeyed the same gospel anybody else did in becoming a Christian. They just need time for growth and development, and they're going to have problems and questions, and they don't have the insight. They need the older, mature, faithful child of God to understand that and to lead them along. I don't think a lot of times that's been done at times by some people. That everybody's just been sort of considered the same, and that causes problems. New Christians, as far as this epistle is concerned, can take encouragement from John because their sins have been forgiven in Christ. That's John 2 12. Now, we're going to have to quit here in just a moment, but forgiveness, let this sink in. Forgiveness is not based upon maturity or perfection. And there are a great many people in the church need to understand that. Forgiveness is not based upon maturity or perfection. Brother Guy in Woods, the late Brother Guy in Woods said one time, the best way to understand some of this is to, at the time of your death, when you've been a member of the church six months or 60 years, and faithful in the time you've been there, is what direction are you going when you die? That's the important point. So our time's run out on us. I want to further develop this. And, and maybe between uh, this time, the Lord will be next week, you have some questions over some of these, somewhat technical material. Uh, what I'm saying, feel free to write them down. Let me have them if you want to Sunday. And we'll deal with them if we, you think it needs to be done. But right now, let's close out the class with the, going to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our gracious Father, we're so thankful we could be together this evening. Thankful that Thou spared our lives so that we could. Help us, Father, to lend our minds to study Thy will. May we ever have honest and good hearts that we might always apply the truth to our lives. Spend much time in the study of Thy word, the meditation of the same, and the application of our lives. Be with us throughout the night. Help us to live to Thee and to grow up in the grace and knowledge of Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.